Good morning. So it's really interesting. Um, you plan a presentation for months. I mean months. Like, you, wait till you see my slides. This is not a game. Like I, I, I did my thing on my slides. And then things happen in the world, and you have to acknowledge that they happened. Now, the degree to which you acknowledge them and the degree to which you allow them to pull you off track, it's a delicate balance that you strike as a presenter. So my hope is that in our short time together, I will be able to strike a balance um, and that you'll actually be able to take something from this that you'll be able to use in your work. Because diversity and inclusion are really important. We need to figure this out, and we, we need to figure out what we're going to do about it, OK? So I'm going to ask you to bring open minds. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something I wouldn't normally do, which is to take out your phones if you haven't done this already. I am going to ask you to participate in some real-time polling. So if you could send a text to 22333, and it should say E-D-I-R-O-C-K-S. So E-D-I rocks. And in case you're wondering, that's equity, diversity, and inclusion rocks. That's what that means. So if you can text that to 22333, when the polls come up, then you'll just be able, your next text will be your response to the poll. Make sense to everybody? All right, great. So what I've decided to do a um, couple things. One is I'm going to move through the presentation fairly quickly. And part of the reason is because I'd like to create a space at the end of the session to have a conversation. I think these are things that we can and we should talk about. I think that's healthy. Um, I wasn't in this morning's session. I understand that it was challenging for some people. Um, and I think we have a lot of challenging things in the environment. So let's have a space and let's talk about some of those things. And I'll do my best to make sure that we have a productive conversation and that you walk out of the room glad that you were here. Fair enough? All right. So this is the street on which I grew up in Queens, New York in the 1970s. I know you can't believe it was the 70s, but yes, it was the 70s. Okay. <laughs> And that is me doing it in front of my grandfather's car <laughs> in my halter top that my father brought me back from France with my Dr. Scholl sandals on. And I was just too cute for words because you can tell from the pose, right? I'm sure you can tell from the pose. Now, here's the thing, and this is a really interesting part. Those Dr. Scholl sandals are now called classics from the original collection. I have some angst over this because when they start talking about things that you had as classic and original, that too says something about where you were in life. Anyway, so um, I had a really interesting childhood. My family is originally from Jamaica, so I'm a child of immigrants, and I grew up in a multi-generational household. Um, so it was a really wonderful way to grow up in Queens at this time. And this was really during the time that Queens was giving birth to hip hop. And so we had a lot of wonderful opportunities to be at block parties with music. And, and childhood was just a really great thing. Our house, my family, was a bit of an anomaly um, in a sense that we were always very diverse. Um, diverse in our community, diverse in school, family members being diverse. And that diversity goes back a long way. So, this is an interesting photo that comes from my family history. And a lot of people look at this picture and actually think that it came from a carnival. You know, like when you dress up and they put the sepia tones on you and everything, right? Like the olden days. Such is not the case. So this picture is from 1915, um, Sierra Leone. And the two people standing in the back are my great-grandmother and great-grandfather. And the two people in the front, the woman, is my great-grandmother's first cousin who was also the godmother and the nanny to the baby that she's holding. The man in the front is best friends or was best friends with my great-grandfather. Now, this is a picture that in 1915 could never have happened in America. Can somebody tell me, just shout it out, we're a small group, what, what's odd about this photo for 1915 if it was in America? They're pictured together. The great grandmother has power. She has the power pose in a bat. You nailed it, right? She has her hand on this white military officer's shoulder. And there's a white woman in the front 
and she's the godmother and the nanny to a black baby to whom she's related. Like, there's a whole lot going on here. This, this is some like really different stuff, right? So for me, the way that I look at diversity has always been different. I, I don't think I see the world through the same lens. And it hasn't been, I would say, probably over the past 15, 20 years that I've really started to understand the complexity of this type of diversity and what it means in our society and what our challenges are. So America then couldn't have had a picture like that. But as we move forward and we look at how we've diversified, America can certainly have a picture like this now, right? Things are starting to look very different. So what we know is that we have four states already that are half, primarily, people of color. So California, Hawaii, New Mexico, and Texas. By 2060, nearly half of all states um, will be primarily people of color. So the country is going to go through this really weird thing. The graying of America, right? So as the boomers are reaching into their 60s, their 70s, and their 80s. But also the browning of America is happening pretty much at the same time, right? So we have some challenges associated with that. And we have some change that's going to be associated with that. Our survival really depends on our ability to evolve. So changes in the environment force organisms to adapt or adjust if they want to survive or thrive. Now here's the crazy thing. When an organism is evolving, rarely does it know or feel that it's going through that evolution. It just does it because it's what it needs to do in order to survive, right? The other part that's crazy is when organisms evolve, they don't know exactly what it is that they will evolve to be. They just know it won't be what they are right now. So I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I think our evolution is particularly challenging because we are aware of the evolution. We can feel the change, and there's an inherent discomfort that comes with that that we're challenged to deal with. So it's interesting because we've spent 40 plus years investing in diversity and inclusion efforts as a way to build a bridge, particularly from the civil rights movement and a time where we were segregated and, and prejudiced and inefficient in a lot of different ways to becoming more diverse and inclusive, right? So we're building this bridge. So, I want you to think about that bridge as I'm talking to you about some of these issues with regard to diversity and inclusion. So here's your first poll. In your mind, how successful have diversity and inclusion efforts been at creating equality in America? So go ahead and you're going to text your answer to 22333. Seems like somewhat successful seems to be a pretty common response. Okay, so you all think the diversity and inclusion efforts have been somewhat successful. So what I'm going to do is to explore this a little bit with you and unpack it a bit, and let's see where things stand. So first we're going to look at diversity and inclusion in society. Now it's interesting, a couple of weeks ago President Obama did a press conference to talk about the fact that high school graduation rates were now 82%, and there's a celebration to be had with regard to that. Now when we look at these numbers and you think about that 82% and you look from the lowest to the highest, you can see that there's a significant disparity there. And particularly when you look at American Indian, Alaska Native, Black and Hispanic populations, the graduation rates are not near that 82%, right? So we can see that with some clarity. Now if you look at the college graduation rates by race only, you'll notice something very similar. But actually, there's a little bit more of a stark contrast right, between the lowest and the highest rates. So this is one way to look at how are we doing with regard to diversity and inclusion. Because we invested a lot coming out of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, desegregating schools, and this idea that everybody would have an opportunity to have a great education. So this makes you wonder and ask the question, how well are we really doing? So the next thing is wages. We've heard a lot of conversation about wage inequality between men and women, certainly. And here's the reality. Women make 20% less than men. Now here's the interesting part of this. If women enter the workforce making less than men, they will make less than men 
pretty much throughout their entire careers. You never actually catch up. That's what the data tell us, right? So those original negotiations that you make when you go into jobs, when you're entering the workforce, really cast a, a long shadow over what your earnings will be over the course of a lifetime, right? So that's around wages. So then here's another thing that's an interesting thing to take a look at. Hate crimes with regard to Hispanics, Jews, gays, whites, and blacks, the rates are either down or up slightly. Now, the fact that we even have to keep data on this is troubling to me. Um, and to say up slightly is a positive thing is, is kind of hard to swallow or fathom. But when you look at these numbers, rates for transgender people have gone up 40%. And rates for American Muslims have gone up 78%, right? But we've been working on diversity and inclusion for 40 plus years and investing tons of money in this. So we have some work to do. I started thinking about the hashtags that we've had in our lives over the past few years and what do they say about us. Hashtags speak volumes about what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what's important to us, what we're communicating about, and those things that we maybe take action on. When you look at these hashtags, and there were so many that I could have included here that I didn't, they speak to the issues that have been important to us. Things that have kept us up at night, things that have bothered us greatly, things that reflect wounds and traumas and assaults that have happened to all different types of people. So whether that's because of race or gender or ethnicity or immigration status, there are so many different hashtags that have captured what we're talking about. And all of them lead back to these ideas around diversity and inclusion and the challenges that we face. Our hashtags are telling on us, too. So now I'm going to take it into a corporate realm and think about diversity and inclusion in corporate spaces. What does that actually look like and what does that mean? So these are the seven most diverse and inclusive companies that we have. Um, among the 5,000 publicly traded companies that are rated by Thomson, Reuters, and Icon, these are the seven best. So they're doing a great job, right? They, they, they are considered diverse and inclusive by a bunch of different measures about who's in management, who gets hired, uh, satisfaction surveys and inclusion surveys, those types of things. So let's find out how are we really doing. Let's look at these seven companies. These are the CEOs of those seven companies. After 40 plus years and billions of dollars invested in diversity and inclusion efforts, the seven most diverse and inclusive companies in America, these are the CEOs. This tells a story. So there's more to the story. Now, here's an interesting thing. They're actually 5.3% of the S&P 1500 companies are named John. 4.3% of CEOs in the S&P 1500 companies are named David. So if you are John or David, your chances of being a CEO at an S&P 1500, pretty good, right? So here's the interesting part. Of all the CEOs, of the S&P 1500, only 4.1% are women. You will have a better chance of being a CEO if you are named John or David than if you were a woman. That's something to think about in the corporate reality, right? So this is a complicated um, visual, so I'm going to try to make it easy for you. This is the pipeline that talks about who enters the CEO pipeline, the people who are going to end up in the C-suite and who actually gets there. So here's what we know. When it comes to men and women, we enter the CEO pipeline at pretty much equal rates. Um, and people of color make up about a third of the people who enter that pipeline. Now, what happens from entry to the pipeline to the C-suite? Here's what we find. White men enter, the CEO pipeline is 35% of the workforce, and they end up being 70% of the CEOs, or the people who are in C-suites. Now, 17% are women of color who enter the pipeline. 3% of them end up in the C-suite. What this means is, if you're a woman of color and a CEO, the chances, I'll put it to you like this, the chances of you seeing that woman of color as a CEO is the same as you walking out the room and seeing this. Okay, that, that's how rare it is. I'm still looking for my unicorn, it's rare. All right, so 
Here's another way to look at diversity and inclusion and how are we doing in a corporate space. Fortune 500 companies that have policies on the books to protect people, regardless of their sexual orientation in 1998, 5%. So how are we doing now? We're doing great. 91% of those companies have some policies on the books to help protect people, regardless of their sexual orientation. So the policies are in place, right? So what's the impact? So what's the number of openly gay Fortune 500 CEOs as of 2015? That would be him. Tim Cook of Apple is the only one. Now, this could be a commentary on a lot of things, not just a corporate context. I mean, we're talking about things in society, individual choices, something that could be very private for people. But the bottom line is, if you look overall at the data, you would expect to see more than one openly gay CEO in the Fortune 500, given that we have policies in place to protect people regardless of their sexual orientation. So again, I ask the question, how are we doing? Now, earlier, I talked about diversity and inclusion in the bridge. And when you build a bridge, you build a bridge to help you really to get over an obstacle, right? So I said earlier that coming out of segregation and so on, that we really turned to diversity and inclusion as a way to fulfill the vision of what America could really look like. Here's what I think we're finding. Diversity and inclusion are actually a bit of a bridge to nowhere. So when you think back to the data about the corporate pipeline, graduation rates, wage inequality, diversity in the C-suite, while society and organizations may not be where they were 40 years ago, we still have a ways to go. So to a large degree, I have to wonder, what's missing? So here's the thing. This is what I think. We can be diverse and not be inclusive. So what I mean by that is we can have lots of different people in the room with different opinions, different experiences, different backgrounds, different values, OK, but not be inclusive. Not give them access to power, not make sure that they have the information that they need, not create an environment where they're able to be fully engaged. So you can be diverse and not be inclusive. OK. Now, you can actually be inclusive but not be diverse. So this is interesting. When everyone is the same, it's really easy to be inclusive, right? Because you tend to be in agreement. So you know, you can be diverse without being inclusive. You can be inclusive without being diverse. But here's the thing. You can be diverse and inclusive, but not equitable. And I'm going to drill down on this thing that I'm talking about that's equity, OK? So equity, I think, is the thing that's missing. And here's why. You can be diverse and inclusive and not equitable, but you cannot be equitable without being diverse and inclusive. They all go together and get wrapped into a nice, neat little package that we need to understand and unpack. So here's how I'm going to help you to understand this. In America, we tend to conflate equality and equity. People talk about them as the same thing, and they're not. They're actually quite different. So the example that I'm going to give you is this. If someone is running, if we were running a race, OK? If I was running next to Usain Bolt, and we were running a 100-meter yard, the 100-meter yard dash thing, right? <laughs> we were doing that. We would line up shoulder to shoulder, OK? And they would fire the start gun, and we would take off and run. And what happens is, based on my preparation, my natural abilities, my effort on that given day, I would have the same chance, an equal chance, as Usain Bolt to win. Go ahead, laugh now. That's OK. All right? So in essence, that's what equality is. All right? Same conditions, and then we all go. Here's what equity is. Equity is where if you're running a 400, the full way around the track, you stagger the start. Can anybody tell me why you stagger the start? Right. So that outside lane is actually a longer distance for someone to run. OK? So we stagger the start so that we make it fair. Right? And in doing that, if you didn't do that, what would happen with the person on the inside lane? They look like they're going faster. They have a shorter distance to run, right? Hence the phrase inside track, OK? So the idea with the staggered start is what's fair. All right. So 
Equity requires us to provide all people with fair opportunities to achieve their full potential. Now, when I say this, probably one of the first things that happens is people say, well, what's fair? Tell me what fair is. I don't get fair. Measure fair. Prove fair to me. So here's the way that I talk about it. Fairness is not so much about quantifying it. Fairness is really about whatever is necessary to get someone, some population, some community, some country, to the best possible outcome. So it's not what I think is fair. It's not what you think is fair. It's whatever is necessary to give everybody the opportunity to get to their best possible outcome. Okay, That's what fair is. So it's really important that we understand that. Here's why. Human beings are actually hardwired for fairness. The science tells us this. So, so this is not just me saying this. And they actually speculate that this comes from the lizard brain, the early human brain, et cetera. When humans were living in groups, in small groups, um, imagine if you had somebody that was the hunter. That was their role, OK? Now imagine that that hunter's cave was really, really cold and they ended up dying because, in essence, they were in substandard housing. The entire group would lose the hunter, right? So you don't have a hunter anymore as a group. So them dying actually jeopardized the entire group because there was an inequity in place. There was something that was unfair, OK, that jeopardized the hunter. So the idea here is groups of early humans recognized that fairness actually helped to keep them safe and actually allowed them to be successful in what they were doing, all right? And there's science on this, and if you want to look it up, it's really actually pretty easy. Human hardwired fairness, and you'll find tons of articles that are actually about this. So we have this thing that's about fairness we're hardwired for. Wonderful. But then there are some other things that are lurking beneath the surface as well. And there are actually three of them. And they tend to pop up when we're stressed or we're under pressure. So one is unconscious bias. And I'm sure many of you have heard of this before. And these are those stereotypes that we carry around that we don't even necessarily know that we have. So it's really interesting. I think of unconscious bias like this. Um, have you ever been in an elevator at a doctor's office or the supermarket and you find yourself humming, sometimes singing aloud, possibly tapping your toe to the music that is playing and you don't even realize it? It's nothing you would ever have in your playlist. It may not even be a song you could say the name to or who the artist was that recorded it, but it's there. And you engage in that music in some way, shape, or form. Unconscious bias, to me, is a soundtrack of our own minds. And we act out and respond to that soundtrack even though we don't know that it's constantly playing. OK? So here's the thing about unconscious bias. No one is exempt. Every single one of us carries it. This is a human trait. It is not a judgment on your character. Not a judgment on my character. It just is. So if you're interested in understanding about your unconscious bias, um, there's something called the Implicit Association Test, the IAT, Implicit Association Test, that Harvard University has available to you online to find out what your unconscious biases are, how deep they are, um, and across a, a, a spectrum. Um, related to different social identities. It's worth the time. Um, it may be a little bit hard to see the results. I don't know anybody who does it and feels comfortable about the results. But frankly, we don't need to be comfortable. We need to be better. Okay. So give it a shot and, and take the time and take the test. It will really help you to begin to see about how you're functioning in the world and how you maybe should do some things differently um, because some of this is getting in your way. The second thing that we have is that everybody wants to be Batman. Right? So we have this thing that's called in-group bias. It's a very human trait. It's this idea that we gravitate towards and we're attracted to people who are like us. Sometimes we don't even realize it. And it plays out in some very interesting ways. So it's whether that um, you know, women tend to gravitate towards women, or whether it's that athletic people gravitate towards athletic people or whether it's people who have money gravitate towards people who have money, we tend to seek comfort in people who are a lot like us. No harm, no foul. It just makes sense, right? So then the third characteristic is prejudice. Now here's the thing that's important. Prejudice in and of itself is not a bad thing. 
Prejudice is to prejudge. We do it all the time. It's what's necessary in order to keep us safe. So for instance, if I'm walking down a dark alley by myself, and I see three large men walking towards me, I don't care who they are. I'm going to grab my bag a little closer. I might take my phone out and phone a friend, you know, and just leave the line open just in case until I get past them to make sure that I'm safe. Now, when they come closer and they get into the light, I realize that it's a priest, a rabbi, and an imam. And I feel stupid, right? Because they're not going to do anything to harm me. But I prejudged that situation because I didn't have all the information necessary. The human trait is to prejudge to keep us safe. So you would be foolish not to prejudge in a situation like that, because you could be putting yourself at risk. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. So you have those three things. You have unconscious bias, in-group bias, and prejudice. Well, those are all things that are taking place in here. What difference do they make? Here's where they start to make a difference, when you have power. So power is this ability to define reality for yourself and for others. The interesting part about it is this. Defining reality is not necessarily what we think it is. Defining reality is about decisions, behaviors, and actions. What you do with that stuff that's going on in your head, OK? Now, I'm going to give you a really, really simple example. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with, um, is anybody from Texas, by the way? Anybody from Texas? OK. I'll still say, I would have said it if they were here anyway, but um, in Texas, textbooks are a huge deal. What goes into textbooks and what's not allowed to go into textbooks is a big, big deal. Because that is a way to define reality, right? What you teach people. So here's an interesting thing. This comes from a Texas textbook that was published by McGraw-Hill. The Atlantic slave trade between the 1500s and 1800s brought millions of workers from Africa to the southern United States to work on agricultural plantations. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this? As you laugh, what's wrong with it? Somebody, anybody? Why is that a problem? Sounds like choice. Sounds like they got paid. Completely disregards murder and kidnapping and torture and everything else that was associated with this, right? So a mother in Texas, her son brought this to her attention. She put it on Facebook. It went viral. McGraw-Hill took a sticker, put it over it in the book, because they couldn't leave it as it was because the outrage was so great. The reason this is important is this. It's not a subtlety or a nuance. There's more to it than that, right? There's power in creating this perception. And there's intent in the way that it was presented. So it's important to recognize that when you take things like prejudice, like unconscious bias, like in-group uh, in bias, and couple it with power through the decisions, the behaviors, and the actions that you take, this is where we end up with the isms. And this is the stuff that makes us all really uncomfortable. Racism, classism, sexism, xenophobia, which is an ism, but it ends in an obia. But you get the idea, right? So we've got lots of isms all around us, and they make us tremendously uncomfortable. Here are what isms are. Isms are really systems of privilege and oppression based on social identity and rooted in the belief that Someone is superior, and someone is inferior. And it plays out in so many different ways. Elitism, that's about, did you graduate from college or not? Classism, that has to do with money and, and things like where you live. Sexism, we know what that is, right? Xenophobia, ageism, OK, wait, and I know this applies. Do you know that ageism kicks in in the United States when you turn 40? Have a moment with that. You're considered, you're considered an elder at the age of 40 according to employment law, right? Because after you're 40, it's harder to get a job. OK, so there are some protections in place for that. So these isms, they're systemic. It's not just about what happens between two people, right? It ha it's what happens when people go to navigate systems and institutions. What is their experience when they go into that corporate pipeline to the C-suite? How does that then play out? That's what the conversation is about. So here's your next poll. Which ism is most in the way 
of an equitable society. Remember when I talked about equity being all people having fair opportunities to achieve their full potential, to get to that best possible outcome, that thing that is fair, that allows them to make the decisions to make the most of their life or their career. Which isms are most in the way? Which ism? Singular ism. Yes, you can only choose one. I had a feeling you were going to say that. And this is just to get a sense of what people think. There's no right or wrong answer here, but just to see what other people think in the room. So it looks like classism is pretty big. And then racism, sexism. So those three seem to be playing out very strongly. And there's an intersection of these things. They don't live independent of one another, right? And we do know that, OK? So I'm going to have to move on from here. And I'm going to crank through the last part of it, because I want to give us a few minutes to talk. So just bear with me, because it's going to be fast. All right. So I talked about the isms being connected to systems of privilege and oppression. And privilege is a complicated thing. Um, because people often think when you say that they have privilege, if I say that I have privilege, that it is some commentary on my character or who I am, am or what I've done. So let me tell you a few things about privilege, because we have to start to have this conversation. Privilege reflects how society assigns disparate values to all of us and how we, in turn, value ourselves. It provides certain benefits and advantages regardless of what you do or what you fail to do. It just is. And it is not your fault, per se. So there's nothing to feel guilty or be, feel shame about. All right, so let's set that out there now and put that aside. So here's how privilege works. Have you ever noticed that there are some people that can get into a pool or an ocean, um, do nothing more but relax on their back, tip their head back, and they float? And they get to look up at the sky, and they make no effort, right? On the flip side, you have people who they have to tread water constantly in order to stay afloat. They can't float just by laying on their back. Well, this is how privilege and oppression work to some degree. People who experience privilege tend to float. People who are oppressed spend a lot of time treading. So here's the thing. If you spend your time treading water and staring, uh, treading water and working furiously versus floating on your back and staring at the sky. What is your experience? Do you see if you're floating? Do you even notice the people who are around you? No, you've got all of the sky in front of you. You've got, that's all you can really see. So I want to give you a moment and ask you to explore your, your privilege, OK? And with this, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Trust me, nothing bad will happen. But I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And we're going to explore your privilege, OK? All right. Privilege is never having to explain to your child how to survive being stopped by the police and being confident they won't be stopped at all. Privilege is never having to discuss your sexual attractions. Privilege is feeling safe regardless of what you're wearing or where you're walking. Privilege is being late, and no one attributes it to your race. Privilege is never being asked what country you're from, even though you were born in the United States. Privilege is never being called a racial slur or having that slur be the name of a professional football team. Privilege is being able to express disagreement without automatically being perceived as emotional. Privilege is not being judged because of the size of your house or the car that you've bought. Privilege is knowing the only reason you didn't get the job is because someone else was better qualified. Privilege is not having to explain your religious holiday and knowing it's legally observed. Privilege is not having to ask for an able-bodied accessible room when you check into a hotel. Privilege is knowing that your rights were written into the original version of the Constitution and not retrofitted as an amendment. Now open your eyes. How many of you, by a show of hands, just thought about a form of privilege that you never really thought about having? Anybody a new form of privilege that you'd never really thought about, right? This is one of the things about privilege. When you have it, you don't necessarily know it. But when you lose it, you really know it, OK? So and I'm going to move forward. 
So we understand that about oppression, when people are oppressed, um, that they're constantly in motion. They, they don't have an opportunity to rest and to float on their backs. They're exhausted from the constant effort of treading. There's little energy left for them to reposition themselves in a pool of water. Survival is usually their highest uh, priority most of the time. And it's really interesting because our society is hooked on oppression. We talk about it, we think about it, we work on it. We even have tax code to reward you for being charitable to deal with oppressed issues, right? But we never really talk about privilege. So here's the thing that I want to tell you about privilege. There are some really crazy things about privilege. Um, it constantly reinforces um, this idea that we're numb to the struggles and oppression of others. It perpetuates inequities that are counter to who we are because we're hardwired for fairness. It encourages a savior mentality. When you're privileged, you're trying to save everybody else and help everybody else. It gets in the way of genuine, meaningful relationships because privileged people end up with privileged people. Okay, And remember what I said to you earlier about prejudice. We prejudge when we don't have enough real information. So if you're not in relationship with people who don't have privilege, what are you going to do? You're going to prejudge. And how does that then play out in the decisions that you would make every single day? Lastly, privilege really fails to prepare us for moments of equality. So if you spend your entire life floating on your back, and all of a sudden, you had to tread water. What would your muscles be like? Weak, right? Uncoordinated, atrophied. So here's what they're finding. The numbers and the rates of suicide and heroin overdose for white men and women in the United States over the last decade has skyrocketed. Now, in addition to prescription drug use and more prescriptions actually going out the door, Scientists, doctors, behavioral health specialists, and psychologists actually are beginning to think that in a way, privilege puts us in a situation that we're less resilient. We're accustomed to things being like this. And when they're not like this anymore and they start to drop down like this, we're less prepared to handle it. We're less prepared to adjust, right? So to some degree, we're in a situation where privilege is actually killing the privileged. And that's why we have to start to have this conversation. So what changes? What do we do differently? Well, equity, diversity, and inclusion need to go together in a package. You can be diverse without being inclusive, right? You can be diverse and inclusive and not be equitable. But you can be equitable, but you can't be equitable without being diverse and inclusive. They have to go together. OK, so that's one part that we know. Privilege and oppression, we need to be aware of it and know what our own privilege is. And there are some reasons for that. Um, but before I get into it, I want to talk to you about this thing that I talk about as perspective transformation. And this is this idea that you will change how you think and what you do. Perspective transformation is that when you know, think, and believe something different, you will decide, act,